So our chair, which I prefer to call president, um, asked me to introduce Chandra Bhatt. And of course, if you do a Google search in Scholar, you're going to find uh, about 1.5 million uh, <laughs> papers from Chandra. But um, that's not what a person is only about, writing papers, getting citations. So I'm going to tell you some things I know about Chandra. We know each other, what, since 1905 or something? <laughs> More than 30 years. Um, I knew Chandra when uh, I did not have gray hair. Um, as a brilliant researcher, over the years, I found out that actually Chandra is a phenomenal father. Has uh, two brilliant daughters, but um, the, he fits, of course, the gentleman and, and scholar prototype. But his fatherhood extends to a myriad of students, which um, I saw him behaving like a father with them in, in, in a few projects. And um, how many of you know what a father does usually? He scolds the kids when they do something wrong. He guides them, or if it's a mother, she guides them. But the most important thing is a role model. And, and, uh, and, the, and even more important is, is the affection that he shows. So in spite of what you, you, you see when Chandra will come here and will tell you a lot of things about time use, really, really, he's deeply emotional with, uh, with his children, either biological or, or intellectual. So, so and, and that, is, that is what I admire in, in, in the person that's gonna give the, 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 the third uh, Keynote of the of the conference. No more delay. Chandra, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I just realized that with all of these tags and mics and my glasses, it's becoming a little difficult these days. But I have to get my glasses on. Um, and let me go to. Uh, let me start by saying it's uh, a very difficult act to follow after Tommy Garling and Eric Miller. Uh, so I'm certainly honored and humbled uh, to be here. Uh, but like them, I would like to start by thanking all my students. Uh, and I think Costas got it right. Uh, just stick with me, regardless of how you feel the experience is right now. Uh, and I would appreciate that. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to thank all of you uh, for being here uh, at this IATBR conference. Uh, the IATBR conference is what we all make of it, what you all make of it. Um, and so for those first timers and uh, uh, the youngsters, I would urge you stay connected, stay linked, and um, you can take it from me. I'm pretty sure you'll be saying the same thing years from now. Uh, it is an investment of a lifetime. Uh, this is a special community. This is family. My wife was here uh, for uh, about two uh, evenings or so. And uh, for various reasons, she's not traveled too much with me. But her first reaction was, wow, wow your colleagues, your peers. It was so easy for her to interact with so many of you. She felt so at home. And I think for one, she realized um, when my kids tell me, and I think they are right, Dad, do you ever have friends? And my response is, you know, my working community is my social family. And I thought she got it, uh, my wife. She understood what I was saying. So uh, it's certainly special for, uh, to be connected. Uh, and it happens through many different ways. Um, it could be through the kinship that develops because you have a common advisor. My associations with uh, many of you, Trevor, Pat Mukhtarian, uh, Jeff, you know, many of you is based on having the common advisor, Frank Koppelman. But the links are uh, through many, many other ways too that will happen here. Uh, but with all that said, I have to say that I do um, uh, owe a deep sense of gratitude 
to uh, two of my contemporaries. Uh, and this, once again, coming back to the idea that uh, as uh, graduate students and as contemporaries, it's uh, very, very special. Um, Costas, uh, as he was talking about it, uh, uh, was uh, alluding to that. Uh, in my case, my two contemporaries uh, uh, who have been there have been uh, Ram Pendiala and Costas Gulias, and it's been very special. Uh, you know, the, the, the feedback, the support, and in some cases, the brutal honesty of the feedback is refreshing. Uh, just to give an example, um, after yesterday's Sirtaki dance, uh, my very good friend Ram Pendiala came up to me and in, without mincing words, uh, effectively told me, um, I think you should just focus on model formulation and estimation. <laughs> Um, and the way I interpreted it was, you know, yes, I know you have a lot of Greek affinity and Greek affiliation. Just keep it to your models. Don't take it to your Greek dances. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's refreshing in many ways. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be taking those uh, things like, like my wife tells me this too, but, you know, it's, it's brutal honesty and, uh, you know, good feedback. So with that, uh, I know I have taken about five minutes of my time, but that's fine. Um, I have, as I like to say, calibrated my duration model to end exactly when Beba says it has to end. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do is um, just go over a little bit of the history of choice models, the whole idea that theory that data and analysis, they are so closely interwoven, something that Eric Miller also talked about. Um, I think it's really the key uh, to model methods and estimation uh, and the choice theory itself very fundamentally. So when you look at the evolution of dependent variable types and methods in uh, our field, you know, we started off uh, as a, a, in the form of continuous variables. And when I talk about our field, I'm not necessarily talking only about the transportation field. I'm talking about a broader economics field. I'm talking about a broader statistics field. Uh, we started with continuous variables. Uh, it was quite easy, quite simple to model these continuous variables using the method of moments, which effectively, in the case of continuous variables, falls down to the, basically the idea of minimizing uh, the least squares, the residual least squares. Uh, and then you had uh, some um, advances uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, taking it to a simulated moments context, starting with McFadden's work in 1989. Uh, but as we did that, uh, you know, we are also moving from the continuous to the discrete, and then there was a period of time uh, where we moved from discrete to discrete continuous. So the dependent variables became things such as time use, where it became uh, the concept of how much do I participate and how much time do I participate. So there was a period where we started moving from discrete to discrete continuous. Now, I'm not saying that there was no discrete continuous work prior to 2000. There was quite a bit of work. But suddenly, there was a flurry of activity in this area. <clears throat> and then, uh, as we did that, we also started moving to multiple discrete continuous. Um, uh, Honeyman, in his 1978 dissertation, uh, did quite a bit of work on discrete continuous. Uh, so did uh, uh, Professor David Brownstone, who's here, and Professor David Bunch. Uh, they all contributed quite substantially to this discrete continuous. And then the frontier moved to multiple discrete continuous. I'll talk a little bit about the concept of multiple discrete continuous in a bit. Uh, but as we started moving toward multiple discrete continuous, you know, starting to add some behavioral elements, which I will not go into, uh, such as response heterogeneity, spatial dependence, social dependence, it, led to the use of uh, certain methods that were different from the usual QMC draws or the MCMC draws, you know, because these, these simulation-based methods, uh, they are useful, but they can get a little unwieldy. 
so started moving toward some other possibilities. One example is the composite marginal likelihood that essentially replaces the objective function to be maximized with a surrogate objective function that has similar good consistency properties and asymptotically normal properties of the estimators as the traditional objective function. So there was a movement toward uh, composite marginal likelihood. And then you, we started also moving uh, uh, till about 2015 or so to going beyond multiple discrete continuous. How can we add other kinds of variables, nominal variables, continuous variables, count variables, duration variables, MDC variables, all of these in the mix together in a joint framework. And as we go into this spectrum, it's very interesting, uh, I find that the field seems to be going back to new analytic approaches rather than confining themselves only to simulation. It's interesting to me because um, when you look at uh, the, the, the continuous discrete models early on, uh, Clark in 1960 started with an analytic approximation for uh, the multivariate cumulative normal distribution function. That was in 1960. Um, the simulation methods uh, you know, started by many others, but um, um, Lerman and Mansky uh, in 1985, as I recall, had a very nice paper. They came up with a frequency simulator, a rather crude frequency simulator. And when they compared that with Clark's analytic approximation, they found that Clark's analytic approximation was doing amazingly well, okay? It was an approximation, analytic, but it literally outperformed their uh, uh, frequency-based simulator. And you know they could not quite explain it, and this is part of some of the things that we have been trying to think about, understand uh, why some methods work well, uh, even if we cannot uh, prove their um, can properties, consistency and asymptotically normal properties, um, <clears throat> but in finite samples, they do extremely well. So lots of nuances and uh, discussions and research uh, ideas opening up here. So this is what is what I would characterize as a very simple representation of the evolution of dependent variable types and methods. Now, I'm not going to go on to this axis of uh, the evolution, but I want to talk a little bit more about the x-axis of evolution. So the rest of my presentation will be focused on the x-axis of evolution. So let's go there. Uh, so let's go to um, multiple discreteness uh, to start off uh, from continuous to discrete to uh, discrete continuous to multiple discreteness. Uh, this whole issue of multiple discreteness is very germane to a lot of um, uh, processes uh, involved in our field. Uh, when you look at the evolution in this particular IATBR, I actually saw a whole lot of papers on this discrete continuous using multiple discrete approaches. Um, now, there are many modeling methods for multiple discreteness. You could use a traditional random utility-based single discrete model by coming up with all the possible combinations, uh, but that really starts blowing up the number of alternatives you have. You can use a multivariate probit logit method, uh, and this is something I do want to emphasize. Um, you might read something in an earlier paper, uh, but I would urge all of us, you know, that might not be true, okay? So this is a case where in my first MDCEV paper uh, in 2005, um, I was basically invoking all the great things about this new formulation I had come up with in a, you know, uh, a decision process that was consistent holistically with utility maximization, et cetera, et cetera. And I essentially dissed the multivariate logit probit methods, uh, I mean, in a, probably even in a disparaging way when I go back uh, to my own paper. But more recently, um, we came up with um, a more refined uh, multiple discrete continuous model that allows more flexibility in the discrete and continuous components. And as we started looking at the processes and the formulations behind it, 
lo and behold, I can now actually show that a multivariate probit method, which I characterize as the statistical stitching in my 2005 paper, is actually can be shown to be consistent with the preliminaries of a basic utility maximizing theory. So I think you know we evolve over time. So uh, I would urge uh, any of you over here, uh, especially the graduate students, you know, don't trust necessarily what you read in papers. Uh, we can have our own minds, and you can have your own minds, and you can come up with something different. Um, uh, the fact is, in 2005, I was quite convinced that the multivariate probit was a statistical stitching until I came up with this new way of uh, viewing things. So things change over time. Uh, now, uh, so we have, we have done this in a time use context, and many of you have used the MDC model, MDCEV model in particular, for time use. Uh, I'm not going to go over these things in too much detail, except to show uh, the um, uh, power of an MDC model. Uh, the nice thing, if, if you can move along a spectrum in your model processes, where a model is more consistent with theory, at least seems to be with decision processes. You have a notion of satiation as you consume more and more of a good. And if that model is so simple that you can replace a complex series of discrete choice models with a simple, easy to estimate, multiple discrete continuous model, wow, that's wonderful. So the whole notion that coming up with new formulations need not necessarily be driven by it has to be more complex. In fact, if the reverse is true. If you can come up with formulations that are simple, that can replace a whole series of uh, uh, traditional models, wow, that's wonderful. So uh, in the MDC case, the whole thing is if I have two people, and if I have two activities, P1 and P2 are the two people, and they can uh, undertake joint activities, uh, and A1 A and A2 are two separate activity types, let's say. Now, uh, if you use the traditional model, you can use the uh, traditional meaning, you use a single discrete and you blow up all the possible combinations. You essentially have 64 plus one, which is no one does any activity during the day, 65 alternatives. Now in the MDC model, it's very simple. I have six alternatives because I'm allowing all possible combinations to happen simultaneously, and I have each box represents an alternative, and I have the none, so no one does anything. So it boils down to seven alternatives. So there's a lot of efficiency gain in thinking and the way you structure your specification so much more, and there is also an underlying behavioral theory that we have uh, the, the essential reason why we have multiple discreteness is because we seek variety of some kind. Uh, now, this shows the, uh, uh, what I showed so far was if I have two people and two activity purposes. Now, if I have more than two people, and if I have just three activity purposes, and if I use a traditional approach, you can see how, as household size increases, the number of alternatives in your single discrete model, whatever you use, increases substantially, while it's much more uh, manageable in your multiple discrete context. So I mean, th there are uh, uh, substantial benefits to uh, moving, rather than using traditional models uh, Eric was talking about this. Um, look at what the nail or what the uh, objective of the task is, and then let's try to think through how we can come up with um, formulations, the hammers, if you will, uh, to address those issues. I won't go into too much detail, and just to be clear, the MDC models, th there is a history even in this, uh, starting with Honeyman, uh, who um, inspired Wales and Woodland, uh, who, to come up with a f the, the first paper I'm really aware of um, uh, dealing uh, explicitly with multiple discreteness. You had Kim Mittal, and then uh, you had this paper in 2005, and the difference in the 2005 paper was it became easily accessible because of making certain assumptions on the stochastic terms, uh, and then in a later paper, uh, we were able to better interpret those parameters and come up with a new utility function itself uh, that would allow easier interpretability. So 
now, in, in the most recent um, work that we completed, uh, we uh, essentially were breaking the tight linkage between the discrete component and the continuous component while still being within a utility maximizing framework. I think that was really the key, uh, at least for me. So we talked about discrete continuous, so let's go further on the x-axis. Now, today we have a world of high-dimensional heterogeneous data. We have um, you know, cameras, GPS, cell phone tracks, you know, so many different sources. Uh, and so many different types of uh, endogenous variables. So the question then becomes, why do we want to jointly model these things? I mean, why do we want to complicate matters? Um, just forget it, just model everything independently. Now, the first thing is, by joint modeling, you can borrow information on other outcomes, so you can get more efficient uh, estimates. Uh, you can intrinsically answer um, uh, questions of a multivariate nature. It obviates the need, this is a little bit statistical, for multiple tests. But something more important that I think we have, in the large scheme of things, uh, focused on as uh, econometricians and the transportation profession, but I don't see this indicated much in the statistical uh, profession where they also do joint modeling, but the joint modeling is invoked on the basis of efficiency. But the, the, at the more fundamental level, if there is jointness and if some endogenous outcomes are used to explain other endogenous outcomes, you can have what is uh, essentially a self-selection-like effect, and it can lead to inconsistent estimation of the effects of one endogenous variable on another. So, um, so the, the, the bottom line is this joint modeling uh, of various different types is not happening only in transportation, in part driven by the ability to get more data on different types of variables simultaneously, but also in clinical biology, in health, you know, in all of these fields, and of course, in transportation. Um, and the, the one thing I would focus here on is jointness can arise because of the impact of common underlying exogenous observed variables, common underlying exogenous unobserved variables, and combinations of both. Of course, if you do not have any common underlying exogenous unobserved variables, you're all set. You can use the uh, uh, typical um, uh, approaches as long as your specification of your independent variables is appropriate. Now, uh, I'll skip this slide uh, because Beba's uh, given me an indication, uh, and as much as you all want to go for a coffee break, I also want my coffee. Um, so the, in terms of um, um, this heterogeneity in variable types, it also has implications for choice set formation. Okay. Um, I remember when I was just starting off at, um, uh, in Austin, Hani Mamasani uh, you know, was, was talking to me and was indicating this whole issue of choice set formation, you know, this bounded rationality issue. Hey, we really need to try to address this. And I think that the, some of the approaches that we have now can focus on choice set formation from quite a different perspective than the traditional sampling or the Mansky type where you have certain alternatives and you prune the alternatives. But how do you prune the alternatives? Now, in, in that regard, uh, we know that uh, decision makers whittle down options to reduce uh, cognitive cost, of course, uh, mental energy, that's the issue there, emotional cost, the psychological stress due to uncertainty in preference ordering when I have especially many alternatives. The, uh, the emotional cost is particularly interesting uh, because there's been quite a bit of literature that we as humans subconsciously are cognitive misers, okay? And one of the reasons why some, in some very heuristic manner, not all this compensatory, all this uh, very analytic, we try to prune down and then make choices from that pruned down set. And one of the reasons is there's a lot of distress when we have a reasonable number of alternatives and we choose one. Because as soon as we have chose one, we feel like we have lost, okay? Because we had to give up so many other alternatives. Um, I know I have about three minutes left, but I have to tell a small story here. Uh, this resonated quite a bit with me 
Um, for some of you who know me quite well, I'm a sucker for ice creams. Uh, even to this day, I can go to a shop and I can just eat ice creams for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, so when I first came to this country, I walked into an um, ice cream shop and I was flustered. I was flustered because I only knew vanilla and chocolate. Okay, those were the only two I had known until then, before I came to this country. And then suddenly, I'm thrown in this, uh, uh, having to choose from this huge choice set, and it threw me off. Um, it really reminded me, and this was actually captured very well in a Bollywood movie that I saw recently. Uh, by the way, see it if you have a chance. It's called English Winglish, okay? English v Winglish. Um, and so you have this lady who uh, comes from India, who's visiting the United States. Um, she does not have a great command of English because she is part of a rural culture, as I recall. Uh, and she goes to a coffee shop. And, you know, she just goes there and asks for coffee. And in the movie, they portray this attendant as being this pretty rude lady uh, who says, so what do you want? You want this, 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 just starts rattling all the possibilities, cafe latte, this, this, you know, and she doesn't know, okay? I mean, she just, and at the end of the thing, she gets, the other person gets angry because uh, this lady uh, from India is apparently delaying others, and this lady from India just leaves and says, I'm just asking for a cup of coffee, what the hell? Okay, just give it to me. So in this whole issue of choice set, right, can fluster, can influence. So um, one of the ways that we have been focusing on this pruning process, let's say, for example, in the context of um, a dwelling unit. So if you're focusing on which dwelling unit to choose, now, rather than, you know, sampling, no, sampling does not address the fundamental behavioral issue of pruning. It's a statistical approach to reduce the computational burden, but it does not address the fundamental pruning process. Now, what we did in a paper is, you know, let's look at all the other uh, characteristics of the dwelling unit. So number of stories, number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, and now this becomes your choice outcome. So all of these are choice outcomes, and they're of different characteristics in terms of variable type, okay? If you're able to model all of these, then you can use this as the first step of a choice set formation. I have pruned down, and the number of dwelling units that are available are based on the uh, uh, choices I uh, decide on for all of these things. So it's a different kind of pruning process. The point I'm trying to make is we have methods today that can accommodate different types of variables. And it's not simply for joint modeling, joint modeling. It can be used for substantial behavioral processes that we want to examine. The many other uh, things, too. Um, I just wanted to give a quick plug to some of Juan de Dios Ortizar's work over here. Um, and this is something I have also talked quite a bit with Joan Walker. Um, this whole notion that um, uh, all these ICLV-type models with attitudes, you know, they basically can be exactly replicated using uh, an exogenous variable approach, where you just put all the exogenous variables directly uh, onto the outcome. Um, I think that needs to be caveated, okay? I think that the, the articulation that they are the same needs to be substantially caveated. That would be true if you just simply use the latent variables as dummy variables or continuous variables in your uh, main choice equation. But it's, the way to think about this, I think, would be much better if we thought about unlabeled alternatives, such as route choice. Okay? In the context of unlabeled alternatives, you're talking about a route, okay? and then you have various characteristics of the route, and then you have these latent variables that impact each of the effects of these exogenous variables. For example, if I'm very safety conscious, then I might be much more sensitive to the volume on the road for bicycling, okay? So these kinds of interaction effects, where you interact the latent variables with the effects of exogenous variables, they engender essentially, you know, exogenous variable-based sensitivity differences, but also, they engender random coefficients, okay, in a nice, compact way. So some things that you might not have thought if you had started originally itself with just pushing all the exogenous variables through, 
Okay? So it's a nice, neat way of capturing um, uh, some of these things. And so uh, similarly, there's another example where we have uh, a, a model that has latent variables. And the reason why I'm bringing latent variables over here is when you have a huge number of out, uh, outcome variables, you might think, hey, your covariance matrix is going to be very substantial. But you can make it extremely parsimonious if you start having some latent variables. Okay? And those latent variables, because they are stochastic and they impact all the other variables in some form or the other, or at least some of them, they engender the jointness. So you have a parsimonious covariance matrix that then becomes much easier to estimate. And in terms of the high dimensionality, today we have these analytic approaches. So let me um, uh, stop my presentation. Uh, this uh, uh, basis for some new analytic approximations, which I won't go over. Uh, but this, this, this is my conclusion slide. So uh, I, I want to em emphasize again identification Theoretical. It is, there is a theoretical component to identification. There is an empirical component to identification. I think both of these have to be thought through extremely carefully. Um, and sometimes I do worry that these black box approaches do not emphasize these identification issues as much as they should. should. Uh, never lose sight of the fundamentals of behavior. Uh, I will admit that we learn from data in terms of uh, perhaps updating our theories and our concepts, but that, that is a core set of theories and concepts that should be held on to. And this is something uh, as much meant for my students who are sitting in this audience. Um, Eric was talking about the high level, uh, macro level, and also the micro level. Now, in the context of choice processes, I think we really need to work on both sides of uh, this issue. So you need to have investigative curiosity and must dig in. So yes, the high level processes, how can we come up with formulations, objective functions, which seem to resonate with what we know in theory. But as we move away from you know, the simplest of, for example, the multinomial logit or the MDCEV models, you know, you have to help in the optimization process. You have to be smart in uh, the way we uh, try to make these models work. Uh, hardwired was the term that Eric used. You know, hardwired softwares, uh, they are not going to do it, okay? We have to understand some of the nitty gritties and rather than say the devil is in the details, I would say the solutions of many of these, you know, how to make these things work, the solutions are in the details. So with that, let me stop. Again, thank you. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, I have a comment, and it's probably based on the fact that I'm probably the oldest guy in this conference at the moment. And uh, when you mentioned the Clark approximation and, and, and the issue of uh, simulation and, and going for a simpler solution, I remember a story that was in MIT at the time, 1978 or something or the other, when Daganzo and his colleagues discovered the Clark approximation, and Lerman and Mansky were uh, advocating the simulation and they have a big row. And eventually, uh, it appeared for a time that the Ganso had won with the cloud approximation, but eventually the simulation method took over. But then, and this is the thing that I want to talk because it relates also to something that Eric Miller said. Um, the Ganso actually, who was one of the great guys in this field, left the field to dedicate himself to something that he thought was more manageable, more practical, more graspable. Hmm? which is traffic flow theory, looking for models which were very simple. Because Daganso has advocated the need for simplicity in understanding the thing. That was what Eric was advocating. And I think that that gives us something, some food for thought in the, in the kind of realm that we are of really going for something that is so incredibly difficult. I said the other day that you were a very nice and simple man, but capable of dealing with the most complicated issues. I cannot. Are you <laughs> so, very kind? <laughs> I think you're just humble. I should learn from you. 
Um, but I, I, I think the bottom line is um, simulation approaches, uh, and yes, many of us have contributed to those approaches, uh, including some of the work we did at UT Austin that is used today in many software packages, introducing quasi Monte Carlo draws into the picture. But I have to say that um, in the past three or four years, I've been moving more and more toward analytic approaches. Uh, and I think there are ways, in the most recent paper, we have quite substantially improved analytic approximation approaches to the multivariate cumulative normal distribution function, uh, way beyond what is currently used in the statistical literature. So one of the things I also like to say, um, and again, uh, directed towards some of the uh, young people here, is uh, you know, transportation, they say, is an applied field. I don't buy that. Uh, I think in transportation, we have contributed in fundamental ways to statistics and to econometrics. So um, in this most recent paper, um, we believe we have done way better than uh, the Gens and Brent's uh, approach to analytic approximations, which is the graph I had, but I didn't have the time to show. So I think you know that, that there are many nuances, though, in the simulation versus analytic approximation debate, you know, uh, the simulation focuses, McFadden's work at least focuses on looking at each probability, not necessarily doing it accurately, but in an unbiased manner, and taking advantage of uh, the averaging, so to say. While the Clark work and some of the recent work that we are doing focuses on computing each individual probability very accurately. So there are issues there, nuances that still have to be worked out.